Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mallory, and I'm really excited to um, be able to speak to you guys today. Um, I decided to talk today about recovery and how it's a forever journey um, because there, there's all these kind of, there's a lot of talk about the word recovered and how it kind of has like this closed door kind of, you know, sound to it. And um, as someone who has full recovery under their belt, um, I'm here to tell you guys kind of what recovery, full recovery really does look like. Um, the beginning stages of recovery, um, for, for so many people, it's, it's the first step into recovery is stepping out of denial. People can tell you so many times you have an eating disorder, you need to get help, but until you actually say, yes, I, maybe I really do have an issue that I need to get help, you know, with, um, until that stage actually comes, and for every person that's going to be different, some people it can take just as simple as one person telling them, um, whereas others it will take, you know, months or even years to step out of denial, um, but that's a like the first part of recovery, um, at least it was for me, and um, I think one of the most important stages of recovery is creating a treatment team, so having, you know, a therapist um, who specializes in eating disorders, a nutritionist, uh, you know, an internist, a psychiatrist for medication, you know, having a well-rounded support team um, as well as, you know, having like mentors um, in recovery, someone who has been through what someone's going through I think is very important as well. So, you know, having that support, um, you know, be there is so important and, you know, people tend to you know, go into treatment and, you know, come out without having any kind of, you know, therapist or, um, you know, anything, you know, coming out of treatment. And I have learned that in order to have a successful recovery, that constant treatment is so, so needed. Um, and um, another thing that is kind of the beginning stages of recovery is as much as eating disorders aren't about food, you know, definitely you have to focus on the food and to kind of, you know, do the meal plans and, um, you know, get that under, you know, control. So then, you know, the individual can start working on, you know, the underlying issues or why they feel the way they do or, why they feel the need to use food to deal with, you know, life and, you know, all of those, you know, issues in their life. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we never actually find out, you know, exact points of our lives of what led to our eating disorder. And I think everybody feels like they need to, to know what at, like all the steps that led to their eating disorder and have everything explained and figured out. But for some people, they just never do figure that out, and that's okay, and that's normal. Um, but I always say that support is number one, um, especially at the beginning of someone's recovery, to have that almost like around-the-clock support if somebody needs, you know, the, you know, residential treatment you know, or any of that, you know, it's always having that around-the-clock support. It's so important to just know that people are behind you and um, are always there for you is so incredibly important. And, you know, to almost keep you in check at first, I had a ton of really, really great um, teachers at my high school who were very well accommodating for me and always said, you know, during your lunch hour, if you need anything, just come to me, you know, come find me in my office. He's like, we'll talk. It's okay. Don't worry about, you know, bothering me or anything. So just having that validation from someone else was really important at the beginning. 
um, and just knowing that there was always somewhere to go. Um, and then the other really important thing for me was having structure and pre-planning. And people that I have worked with in the eating disorder community um, who are just starting out recovery really don't like putting in the work that recovery you know, takes and um, because it's easier just to not do anything, but it's so, so vital to, you know, have structure in your day and really pre-plan because our minds are so chaotic and are going a mile a minute. And so to me, it was so important that I had, you know, a pre-plan of my, my whole entire day. Um, that was really helpful for me. I literally would write, I would, the night before I would write, 8 a.m., I wake up, 8.30, I eat breakfast, and this is what I'm eating for breakfast, and 8.45, I would go to school, because, and I needed that kind of structure at first, because I would be just going a mile a minute, and being at school, because, you know, I was in high school when I was in recovery, and so you kind of forget sometimes the important things and you kind of forget about recovery and that you do have to have lunch, you do have to have your snack. And so putting that in, you know, a pre-planned day as though as it's a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort and can kind of be annoying, it's really, really helpful um, as it was for me. Um, some, so, for, you know, recovery and eating disorders, we kind of want to take away that negative coping skill, um, which is, you know, dealing with food, um, you know, surrounding food, and kind of use something healthy to deal with our emotions or our triggers or stressors. And mm -hmm. one of the very first things that I, I had done was I created a healthy contract with my therapist. and. At the top, it said, you know, before I, Mallory, engage in eating disorder behaviors, I will do the following list for at least two, it was like at least 45 minutes before I decide to engage in any other behaviors. And so then there was a list of all these healthy coping skills. There was about 40 I think on my list I just would keep coming up with them and there was like calling my best friend to just talk about anything you know random that had nothing to do with struggling or eating eating disorders and um, you know another one I I loved the show Reba I, I'm a huge country music fan so I, I don't I just used to watch the day the television show that was on during the day Reba anyone's ever watched it, it's, it's hilarious. So I would go and watch episodes of that as I have each season, each season on DVD. So I could just pop that in any time I wanted. And, um, but, you know, it, it took my mind off of it. It made me laugh. Um, you know, taking a walk always helped me. I have the cutest little puppy. Um, and, you know, playing with her, you know, was on my list. So there were so many things on my list that was just kind of, deal with things in a better way than um, not engaging in eating disorder behaviors. And the point of this was that by the time I was done, you know, doing all of these different activities for 45 minutes is that need to, whether it's been and purging or going to the gym to over-exercise, all, like, it had lessened or that need was kind of gone. And so, because sometimes, you know, we have this impulse that we need to do something right away and we need to kind of take a step back and do something else to kind of get our minds off of it and that it does go away. Um, I, I put in quotes, Ed Proof Your House, because I wrote this in my book um, and this was really helpful my recovery um, that I, I, I kind of came up with by myself. Um, nobody really told me 
to do this. Um, but I basically, I remember coming back to my, my house after being in, in treatment, and it was very triggering for me to be back in my, my house where a lot of memories um, were, were there. Um, and so I remember saying I was going to ed proof my house. And so part of ed proofing my house was I put on my refrigerator door, um, there was all these magnetic quotes that I found. Um, also that food is my friend, not ed, which is the acronym for eating disorder. Um, and then um, that was something I did. So whenever I walked into the kitchen, whether for a lunch or a snack, it was this positive reinforcement that I was doing something good for myself. Um, so that was actually really helpful to have that. Um, I, I struggled with bulimia and uh, I created um, index cards that had all the health consequences of bulimia um, and self-induced vomiting on there. And um, it said, walk out at the bottom. And at the top, it said, stop, don't do it. And I put those on all the toilet seat covers of every bathroom. And people who'd walk into my house who had no idea that I was struggling would be like, what is this? But, you know, the thing is, is with bulimia and that, you know, anxiety feeling after binging that you have to, you know, get rid of, you know, what you had just put in your body, you know, it, you kind of, you don't really think, you just kind of act on this impulse. And sometimes, like I said before, you kind of need to take a step back and realize, you know, where you're at, that you're safe, your surroundings, and just kind of breathe. And so kind of having that, you know, that something to read before I actually acted upon this was really helpful because it made me take a step back and be like, okay, this isn't good for me. And even though I really want to do it, let me think about it. Um, and a lot of times it just, I would listen. It said, walk out. And I would just be like, I need to listen to it, just walk out. And so that was really helpful. Um, getting rid of my scale. Um, my parents had a scale. I didn't own my own. But my parents didn't want to get rid of it. Um, so they'd hide it from me. And people with eating disorders are really good at finding the everything that's hidden from them. Um, and people usually don't do a good enough job at hiding things. So um, and as hard as it was to get rid of my, my scale, um, because, you know, the scale is like your best friend, but your worst enemy at the same time. Um, but ultimately, it was really toxic and not in my best favor um, to keep around. So it was glass, and I just threw it out um, of the second story window and watched it shatter all on the ground. So so it was kind of nice to like watch it shatter and just kind of like go away. Um, but you know, getting rid of, you know, my all of, you know, you know, kind of ed proofing your house in different ways. And I had quotes, posters and all of that, you know, just to be surrounded by a positive, um, you know, by positive thoughts, positive things surrounding me that was really important. Um, I, I had something where um, it was kind of like a reward system where I would set goals that were reasonable um, and then kind of reward myself with, um, I love shoes, I'm a big shoe lover, so if I was able to, you know, have a goal that, you know, I had set that was really, really hard for me, um, and I was able to achieve it. Um, not every time that I set goals, because I set goals every day. Um, and so for me to buy myself a new pair of shoes for every goal that I set and achieved, I would probably have four closets full. So, um, no, I didn't reward myself for every goal, but you know, there are some goals that are, are more challenging and um, kind of take a longer time than others. Um, and 
so my bigger goals that I set with my therapist, I when I would reach them, I would reward myself with something. And whether most of the time it was a pair of shoes, um, but sometimes it was, you know, just as simple as, you know, going to buy a new, like, quotes poster or something, just a little something. It doesn't have to be big. Um, another thing that I did um, during my recovery that was great for me was role playing. And I did this in treatment, and I did it with my therapist. And it was role playing with my eating disorder. And so I would, you know, pretend I was my eating disorder and say everything that my eating disorder had on its mind. And then I would switch, and I would be Mallory, and I would talk to my eating disorder um, and comment on what it was saying. And at first it was very intimidating and very hard because I did not want to fight it. I didn't really want to say anything negative to it because I kind of believed everything that it, it said. But over time, it became a lot easier to talk to my eating disorder and to fight it and to not be afraid to yell at it, even though it was just a chair full of air. Um, you know, you pretend that, it's, that it really is your eating disorder and you do get angry, you do get sad, you do cry, and, you know, it's it's a process, but role-playing really helped me, you know, dis distinguish my voice from my eating disorder's voice and realizing that I'm not my eating disorder and that, you know, there was, you know, times where, you know, I got angry and you're supposed to get angry and there were times where I got sad and we're supposed to get sad and so, you know, there's all these things with time, you know, that you begin to kind of open up and so that was um, really helpful for me. Um, for body image, something that uh, really was the best thing that I ever did and some people don't like doing this. Um, and um, for some people, it doesn't work good for them. Um, but body tracing was something I did where I drew what I thought I looked like. And I wrote in, you know, the different parts of my body where I felt um, like anger, shame, guilt. You know, I wrote it where I kind of felt it being carried on me. And then my therapist went over and, you know, drew what I actually looked like, and, and for me, that was the biggest eye-opener. It's kind of like when, you know, you're stepping out of denial and saying, I have a problem, um, you know, maybe I actually do have an eating disorder. This is, this is a big breakthrough in the fact that, you know, wow, I don't see myself the way other people see me, and I had no idea until I actually saw that and saw reality staring back at me. So that was definitely a big breakthrough. And whenever I felt like, you know, I was big or that I, you know, felt, you know, really just didn't feel like I was fitting, you know, into the body that I, I should, I, I took out that big sheet of paper that I was drawn out um, and I looked at that to re, you know, have reality, you know, basically be put in my face again. And that was really helpful for me um, to start the process of my body image um, and working on that. Um, I had a mentor in my recovery, and she actually uh, didn't have an eating disorder, but was so, so just incredibly knowledgeable about life and had other, um, you know, struggles with other things when she was younger, and she's like about seven years older than me, and she was actually my Spanish teacher, but she took the time, you know, 24 hours a day to be by my side, and she wasn't a therapist, and, um, you know, but she understood in a way that other people didn't, and, you know, having that, you know, that kind of feeling that somebody really, really does 
care about you and is really taking their their life and time out for you was um, it was really a great feeling and just you know knowing you know if I had a crisis mode I knew that I had somebody to go to that I could trust so um, having a mentor in my recovery was really um, helpful um, and writing to my eating disorder whenever I was angry or upset I would write to my eating disorder I, I'm, a, I'm a big writer so whenever I had something to say I could always express it the best in writing and so journaling every night was something you know I, I always did um, to just you know process things and sometimes to even figure out how the way I was feeling I didn't know until I actually started writing it down and it kind of made sense to me um, so I really love journaling and I know this is um, lower on the list um, or farther down but I wrote a gratitude journal um, because I um, I started writing a gratitude journal um, actually far into my eating disorder recovery um, but I it was the best thing I ever did and I still do it every night because I think when we're in recovery um, from an eating disorder we and for anybody you know life is so crazy we take so much for granted and I think sometimes with you know people who struggle with eating disorders is we feel really alone and um, you know even noticing the littlest things that you know your best friend gave you a hug or your best friend talked to you or your mom said she loved you you know those little things that you don't pay attention to it really makes you feel like you know you're supported you're loved and you feel really grateful for that when you focus on the little things because um, that's what really means a lot and you know my lists every night you know has some of the same things and some of the different some different things like having a roof over my head um, you know having you know money to to buy food you know those are just you know things that everybody um, I think takes for granted sometimes um, so just even the, the small things um, are really great to focus in on um, I did mindfulness is something that I still talk with my therapist about because um, I still use it in my everyday life all these healthy coping skills that that I have talked about is still stuff that I, I, I do sometimes um, because you know in life we sometimes need to go back and you know reteach ourselves some things that we've learned and um, mindfulness was one of those um, that I do all the time because I still I am that perfectionist and um, it's not white or black thinking anymore but I need to take a step back in my life um, every day um, for like half an hour and just relax and focus on me and I think you know with recovery our days are so hectic so focused on recovery and school and work and kids and you know all of that that we need to relax and focus on ourselves and so mindfulness was really really helpful for me to just relax and have my mind stop running for even five minutes that was my goal was five minutes and it took months but I got the five minutes down eventually um, but that was definitely something that that I still do and it's something that was really helpful for me to just kind of be in the here and now um, and then I had an ed box where I created, um, I got a box from Joanne Fabrics and basically had, you know, this, you know, I created the outside as like positive and got all these different, you know, glitters and um, my favorite colors and my favorite words and quotes and stickers and created this box. It was it was very pretty on the outside. Then on the inside, I found fire tape, like duct tape. 
So my friend was like, oh, you know, you should put this on the inside. So I, I layered the inside with this, like, fire duct tape. And so the point was is whenever I had an eating disorder thought, whenever my eating disorder decided to talk to me, I would write it down on a sheet of paper, and I would put it in the box, and it was like symbolic in the way that it was like, you know, those thoughts are now written down, they're ripped up, and they're gone. And you can't open the box, you can't, you know, reread it, it's gone, and it's like, you know, in flames in the box because it had the fire tape. So, um, but that was really helpful for me um, to release, you know, my different thoughts. Um, and then I, um, and then one night I decided to record myself um, when I had like a really great night. I, I went to dinner with my friend and, and I didn't hear my eating disorder's voice at all. It, it, I don't know if it was on duty somewhere else that night, but it did not come with me to dinner, not before, not during, not after. And after dinner, I was like, I, I asked my friend, something happened. I'm like, I said, my eating disorder didn't come with me to dinner for the first time, and that was really big for me. And so I remember being in a really great place and a great mood and I remember recording that great moment and, you know, that great place was in and talking, you know, to that person who's not in a good place saying, you know, that y you've been, you know, at this good place and, you know, you will get there again, kind of having hope that you've been there and you can get there again and to hear yourself talking in that good place when you're not in a good place is so, so helpful. So for me, I mean, just, you know, grabbing a voice like recording it on my iPhone or, you know, if you can, you know, get some kind of audio thing going on, um, that was really, really helpful for me. Um, so how is full recovery actually reached? And, um, you know, full recovery, I mean, recovery is a process and full recovery is still a process. It, it never really ends. Um, but, you know, how you can get into a place of full recovery is utilizing your support. Um, you know, just anyone who is trying to help you or, you know, asking for what you need, um, not, you know, what you needed yesterday or tomorrow or five minutes from now, but what you actually need right now, um, you know, and going to the people who can help you is so important. Um, stop making excuses. I remember making so many excuses. Um, sure, I'll, um, you know, I'll go to a nutritionist, but hold the meal plan. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll eat this, but hold the weight gain. You know, how many times I made excuses and didn't want to fully, you know, jump into recovery. Um, it, it, you kind of have to stop making excuses and trust your, your treatment team and the people who went to school um, and got their degrees um, because they know what's best. Um, and that's kind of what I had to keep telling myself is to trust um, those people who are trying to help me um, because trusting my eating disorder got me into a place of near death and so obviously that trust was broken so um, you know trusting someone who's actually trying to help you um, and then you know I I learned that courage the word courage to me means feel the fear but do it anyway and recovery is all about that. It's scary. I, we, you know, change is scary. Um, not knowing, you know, what's going to happen or what, you know, the end result of recovery is going to be, if you're going to like it, um, how hard it's going to be. But, you know, being afraid but still, you know, choosing recovery and still just closing your eyes and jumping in anyway um, is, is having courage and that's how you're going to, you know, be on your way of reaching full recovery. Um, the only way 
to fully recover is to believe in yourself. Everyone can bully for you. Everyone can tell you you're beautiful. Um, but until you believe it, you, it means nothing. So, um, you know, I had days where my therapist said, you know, I will believe for you today. And that's what I needed then. But until you actually believe for yourself and trust yourself, um, you know, you're never, you can't get to that point of full recovery. Um, hope, hope, that seed of hope that I had um, on, you know, the night where I was laying in a hospital bed, um, you know, where the doctor said I might not make it through the night, um, that seed of hope that I, I had that night that wanted to get better, um, that was something that I carried along with me on my whole recovery journey um, because, you know, with hope, you know, you can, you can really do anything. Um, and people say, you know, I mean, I once said making friends with food, making friends with the mirror, um, loving myself, accepting myself, accepting others, um, you know, being able to eat a full meal, um, you know, in public with friends, um, and family, I thought all of that was impossible. I didn't think that a life of happiness, health, and a life without my eating disorder is really possible. Um, and so part of recovery is doing the impossible. What you once thought was impossible, you are doing it. And if you can recover from your eating disorder, you can really do anything. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, recover from my eating disorder is the most rewarding thing and I know that I can do whatever I want in my life and that I can be successful at whatever I want in my life because of what I've gone through. Um, and then part of recovery is relapsing. It's falling down. It's having slips. It's, you know, making mistakes. Um, but just like in, in everyday life, we fall down but we stand back up, and that's how you reach full recovery, is falling down but standing back up. Um, there's a quote, you fall down seven times and you stand up eight, and that's how you fully recover, and that is so true, because um, it's all about getting back up and keep moving forward, because, you know, you're never back, you know, when people are climbing a mountain and you fall down, you're never really back at the bottom in recovery because you have so many tools, so much insight, so much, you know, this foundation that you didn't have before um, that you have now. And so you're never back at day one. You know, people are saying, I'm back at day one. I relapse. Um, well, you're not really back at day one. You're just back where you, you know, left off. And, um, basically just utilizing the recovery that has been given to you and um, what does full recovery look like? Um, I think full recovery looks like for me it, it's not perfect. Um, it's not this you know sunshine and rainbows world. It's um, dealing with the good, the bad, the happy and sad. It, dealing with the emotions and, and being okay with that and being able to deal with it without using your eating disorder. And sometimes your eating disorder voice may come back when you have stressors or triggers, but it's all about not giving in to it. And, um, you know, that's what full recovery looks like. Um, and, you know, finding what, what you enjoy um, in life, you know, hobbies. Um, you know, for me, music was is a big part of my life and a big part of my recovery. So singing again, being able to blast the radio um, and, you know, sing in the car again. And um, I, I like golf, so I, I play golf again. I like taking walks. I like nature. Um, you know, all those things is something that, that I enjoy and that I get to, you know, that I found out in recovery and that I am, you know, 
getting to live every day. Um, and then definitely loving, loving myself and loving others. That's something that um, that ANA, the National um, Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, they say accept yourself and accept others. So that was really big for me to hear that because I'm like, well, I accept others, but I don't accept myself. So maybe I need to work on that. So you know, I always say, you know, to be able to accept yourself and then to be able to love yourself. Um, is a really big deal and something that in recovery you never think will happen. Do I wake up and love the way my body looks every day? No, but I, I accept it and I love who I am and the person that I am. Um, and I always say in order to love other people, you have to love yourself. And that's, you know, where accept yourself and accept others. You know, in order to accept others, you have to accept yourself. And, you know, because it all starts within you. And, um, you know, we all say that we need our eating disorder to be successful, to be thin, to be pretty, to get A's in school, you know, basically to have this perfect life that we think is possible. Um, but actually, when you are without your eating disorder and in recovery, you actually do get to be successful and go after your dreams because you're, you're, being healthy, um, you're being you, you're you're being that person, that unique person that nobody else is, and nobody else is ever going to be, and um, so you are able to be successful now that you're able to, you know, go after the things that you want. Um, and being present, because with eating disorders, we're living in the future or we're living in the past. And so mindfulness helps with being present, but just actually getting to be and enjoy life is just so incredible. And, you know, I, recovery has allowed me to open up my, my ideas of, of dating and um, never thought I would ever want to date and get out there and because I'm like, well, he may hurt me and I don't want to deal with that. Um, but you know, if you don't do it anyway, you never know. Um, and so um, definitely that, you know, you're actually, you know, living your life and, and doing things that you never thought you would ever do before. And part of that is falling in love and getting your heart broken like, I, like it has happened to me. But you fall in love again and somebody else will love you again. Um, and so it, it's a learning experience. And when you start to live your life, you are on that, you know, journey that, you know, of, of life and reality. And, um, you know, basically, you know, I say that, you know, recovery is a forever journey because, you know, you're always learning, you're always growing, whether it's with eating disorder stuff or just plain old simple grieving or, you know, triggers, um, you know, marriage, divorce, whatever it is, you're always growing, you're always learning, and you're always becoming better, um, making mistakes but learning from them. Um, you know, that's what reality looks like. Um, and, you know, that's what life looks like, and I think, you know, there's never this perfect word, this perfect world um, that we will ever live in um, or that society might say is possible. Um, but, you know, I think the best gift to yourself is really accepting yourself and treating yourself well um, because that's the best kind of life that you're going to live. And it's, you know, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be happy, and you're going to be able to do what you want to in life. And I never thought in a million years I would be where I am in full recovery um, and, you know, write, you know, writing a book, speaking, um, you know, all of this stuff. Never thought in a million years, but, you know, nothing is ever planned out the way we, we planned when we were like five years old. So, um, 
I'm very blessed to be where I am, and I, you know, as much as I wouldn't wish an eating disorder on anybody, it really helped me grow and become the person I am today that I wouldn't change for, for anything. Um, so Be Freed um, is a book that I wrote on my recovery, um, how I reached full recovery for my eating disorder and how one can too with helpful tools um, for people to um, use um, or try out that worked for me. Um, but my goal of this book was to ignite hope for those struggling at any age, because um, I do believe full recovery is possible at any age. Um, and it, it's available pretty much anywhere where books are sold um, or my publishing company. So um, those are ways to get it if you're interested. Um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs>